coming up on Inside California Education. Hey there, scuba kiddos. My name is Kaylee and I am your scuba expert for the day. Students do a deep dive into marine science at a state-of-the-art aquarium located on the Cabrillo High School campus in Lompoc. Young people in Los Angeles juvenile detention centers are becoming more engaged in school through a new program called Road to Success. Everything's working, blinking, quite good. Meet the IT guy for Yuba City Schools as he makes the rounds, ensuring that the district's technology is running smoothly. And we'll explore why some school districts in California are facing budget deficits and how that may impact schools. It's all next on Inside California Education. Funding for Inside California Education is made possible by... Since 1985, the California Lottery has raised more than $34 billion in supplemental funding for California's 1,100 public school districts from kindergarten through college. That's approximately $211 for each full-time student based on $1.7 billion contributed in fiscal year 2017-18. With caring teachers, committed administrators, and active parents, every public school student can realize their dreams. The California Lottery, imagine the possibilities. The Stewart Foundation, improving life outcomes for young people through education. Most people, when they hear that we have an aquarium, they visualize a classroom with a couple of tanks in there. But when they come and, and actually see what we have, they're pretty blown away because of the scope of what we're doing. This is where the magic happens, right here. We have a plethora of marine life. The main floor of the aquarium is over 5,000 square feet and houses more than 25 exhibits. The one-of-a-kind facility is located at Cabrillo High School in the central coast town of Lompoc. Once a month, we host an evening open house to the community at large. Hi, welcome to the Cabrillo Aquarium. It's just a great way for the community to see what the students are doing and what we're all about here at the Cabrillo High School Aquarium. We're hosting over 7,000 visitors a year, and the students are the tour guides. As advisors, we just kind of step back and let them take over and run the show. And that little red dot right there, that is Point Conception, right next to our near and dear town of Wampo. The students, basically, they do everything. At the beginning of each school year, there's a pretty intensive training period in terms of how to do the, you know, the husbandry techniques and uh, what the different roles are. But you can still feed them again, yeah, because they digest pretty quickly. Whenever I say I work in an aquarium, my head curator, they're like, oh, okay, so like there's a tank and you're the guy who cleans the tank. No, 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 no. I'm one of the few students who are in charge of a multi-million dollar facility. Okay, you guys are budding up. Do you, not, do you have a job yet? Not yet. Not yet. I don't think anybody has estuary yet if you want to cover that tank. This aquarium is the real deal. There's nothing like it. <laughs> I know, I googled how many aquariums are in high schools. I couldn't find anyone. There's just a really cool synergy where students have to work together with one another. The hands-on component is the most powerful part. They feed the animals. They take care of the exhibits. There's times where, you know, something breaks down and it's a great opportunity for a student to learn how to fix things like that. If you don't do that, animals are gonna suffer. You know, animals would die. The animals definitely depend on us, and it's, it's a huge responsibility to have to watch out for all these different animals that live in these tanks, and then even hatching like baby sharks, for example. That's a very difficult task. The ability of us to have animals breeding in captivity is really a testament to the job that the students are doing. 
I think that's the hermit crab over there. We're not trying to crank out marine scientists. Honestly, um, it's, this is a training program. So talk about that, definitely. Besides that, a big part of their job is they got to train the next generation. And not only that, they got to get them interested in wanting to take on that responsibility and carry the baton and keep the program growing and improving every year. The aquarium started modestly in 1986 with the vision of one teacher, Dave Long. Through private donations and grants, Dave's dream has grown from a small club to a program with more than 200 students enrolled in classes that cover topics like tourism, marine science, and aquarium operations. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. The Cabrillo High School Aquarium is a passionate part of my life and I'm extremely proud of it. And the reason that I am is to see the students that work in here. Hi, hey. how are you? One of my favorites. Oh, thank you. It's overwhelming to come and then see it uh, continue to perpetuate itself through these students. All right, hey you guys, so my name is Naomi. I'm Natalie. When we see young people and they're talking to little children uh, about uh, what they're passionate about. There is no teacher that could give them the same message as those high school students who those young people look up to and admire. All right, hey there scuba kiddos. My name is Kaylee and I am your scuba expert for the day. It's really wonderful to be able to work with the kids of our community. For some of these children, it's their first time they've ever had an encounter with water or the ocean itself. So for me to be able to show them how wonderful it is and how much there is to learn about it is awesome. Perfect, they're all ready for us. I've had anywhere from a kid smiling saying, you made my day, I really love the ocean a lot more now, to I'm going to go to Cabrillo High School because I want to be like you and work in the Cabrillo High School Aquarium. I'm so excited that I have the pleasure of diving with all of you today. We just give the best experience to the kids that come through. We can really change lives. Do any of you know what an adaptation is? Yes. Getting used to like a certain place or awesome. temperature. I think I definitely wouldn't be the person I am today. The aquarium has really grown a lot more confidence in myself. As I was growing up, I had a bad speech impediment and I actually had learning disabilities as well. Like working in this aquarium, it's just shown me just if you really want to do something, you'll be able to achieve it no matter how hard it seems that it may be. My junior year, I lost my dad to stage four cancer and I really wanted to give up. When I learn more about the ocean, it makes me feel that I may be closer to my dad. He always told me to never give up, like share your passion, do as much as you can, and that's where I am today. It is so satisfying to me to see students grow and develop and rise. They come in here and they just, a spark is like lit. They are capable of doing such amazing things and they just need opportunities. This aquarium, it's a tool. It's a tool for students to be able to take their learning to a whole new level. Party of the animals at the Cabrillo High School Aquarium are native to the nearby Central Coast. That includes cartilage fish like horn sharks and swell sharks, as well as bony fish like surf perch and sculpins. The aquarium also features thornback rays, as well as invertebrate animals like sea cucumbers, sea urchins, sea stars, and corals. Being institutionalized has changed my life because I have learned how to control many parts of myself while being locked up. I have actually learned you cannot win nothing in this world going around being angry. I have respect now towards other people. I know how to talk to people while being locked up. You basically just learn the ways of living life, but some people take it for granted. At Camp Scott, the, the juveniles are remanded to custody. They live here. 
uh, for the entire length of their um, sentence. They eat, sleep, uh, have recreation, go to school, everything here on campus. Oftentimes our students uh, miss a lot of school on the outs, we call it the outs, in the community. And so when they get here, um, there's huge gaps in their education. And what was challenging was making them want to learn. Los Angeles County decided that we need to change the way we provided education for this population. There was a lot of behavior issues with the students. And so this was a camp that was identified, the girls camp, as a place to start that change. Ready to put the first four pairs in the squares. Who would like to do that for me? You do it. A team got together uh, to talk about what could be done as far as a different approach. And that group came uh, up with what became the Road to Success Academies. The Road to Success approach uses projects to grab the attention of these students, many of whom say they were failing in traditional schools. Some, like Noelia, never went to high school. Remember your two suitcases, one personal, one Holocaust. Their project today is to assemble a suitcase with items you would take if forced into a concentration camp. It's part of a broader lesson students are learning about the Holocaust. Is this an egg you're taking in there? Yeah, and some peas, and my cell phone. The projects that we do are teacher created, which really energizes the teacher because we have voice and choice in what we are going to teach as far as the project. Awesome. How about um, recessive G? What does that stand for? White hair. White hair? Very I expect good. that the teachers to not engage in this as much as they do, but they really do. They, they engage in us. We do a lot of projects. Honestly, I rather, I'm glad that I really came here because if I was out, I would not have come to school at all. Students who never wanted to learn anything come here and go, why isn't this how school is on the outs? Road to Success started here at Camp Scott in 2010. It's since expanded to this boys camp, Camp McAuliffe, as well as juvenile halls and camps throughout Los Angeles County. Step inside a classroom in any one of these facilities and you're immediately greeted by a student ambassador who will explain the project that they're currently working on. Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Noelia, and in our school we do project-based learning. When we were designing Road to Success, we wanted the ownership to be with the students. So when community members or guests come in, all the adults back off, and the students will take you around as a guide. The bigger picture of this is we're really trying to change the narrative for this population. These are primarily black, black and brown students and we're really trying to change that narrative in terms of how they see themselves and helping them become empowered. Empowerment also comes in the form of themes that cycle through the camp classrooms. Among the themes are power, hope, social responsibility and transformation. Transformation is a good one because we get to talk about um, the transformation of America, but we also can get to the core, which is how is a person transformed through certain actions, and then we can get the kids talking about how they're going to transform, how they're going to change. Deshaun Banks has been a teacher at this boys camp for 11 years. He says Road to Success puts an emphasis on the emotional needs of his students in a way that did not exist before. The social emotional part of RTSA is really big, and that's not hard as a teacher. It's kind of the things we're supposed to do anyway. A ask the kids how they're doing. How, how was your day? How, how was the dorm? So just real life talks with the kids, treating kids like individuals and not like, you know, a group of criminals or anything like that. I have to change my ways, change certain ways. I can't do the same thing I was doing a year ago, two years ago. Now, I'm 18, I'm looking at the bigger picture. So I'm just glad that God gave me a chance to come here before I turned 18 and I really would have been in big trouble. Yeah, it just changed me a lot because without here, I would have been somewhere way else. These are children uh, that have gone through some very difficult things, unfortunately, sometimes not a fault of their own. Yes, they've made wrong decisions, but they're incredible. They're highly intelligent. They have amazing potential. And do research on families that would most likely carry this gene. And we are With these kids, like a lot of them leave here and get killed or they get life in prison or uh, 
maximum sentences and you hear those stories so often so it has to be my job to go into these classrooms and really really try to get these kids to think different I think this is where I'm supposed to be I think God placed me here to talk to these kids the way they need to be talked to still ahead on inside California education we look at why some school districts in California are facing financial trouble and how that may impact students in those districts. But first, let's spend a day in the life of an information technology specialist for Yuba City Schools. How you guys doing, everything okay? My computer doesn't work. I pushed something and now everything's gone. I broke my Google. I think probably you, James, and I need to get together and have a, a conversation around this, so. Look, if you break it, I fix it. I mean, I'm, that's my job. I'm here to do that. Everything's working, blinking, lights good? Yes, everything's working. Okay. My name is Eli Fox. I am a computer tech two with uh, Yupa City Unified School District and I work at Riverbend Elementary School. So is this something that I should know how to do? Not really. This okay. is, I have people who literally are shake, their hands shake as they go to turn the power on the computer. They think it's going to pop. And then I have other people who are like, nope, I got this. Get out of my way. You want to make sure that people feel empowered and that they're, that they're not feeling like, well, they're dumb for asking a question. There are no dumb questions. Perfect. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you. I work collaboratively with the site principals and the VPs so that everybody's aware of what's actually going on. I think we need to put our three minds together and uh, we can come up with a plan. Working with the teachers, our goal is to make them functional. They are priority one. We got to get them up and going um, because they're going to have 30 kids standing there staring at them and they're they're trying to be productive. Really make sure you, you, you get your logins figured out and to sign out when you're done because people will delete your stuff. The interaction with students, are they're, they are fun. They've learned a little bit of programming, a little bit of networking, and they learn how to, to create their own little servers. So they're, they're kind of learning some basic technical computer skills that I think going into the future are really going to serve them well. What keeps me coming back is, I honestly, I like the thrill of the problem solving. When the lights are blinking, it's all on, I'm a happy guy. I love what I do and I, I get to work with some of the best people in the state. Everything working? Lights blinking? Everything's great because you, my friend. No. Getting to work with the people I work with is, is pretty awesome. It's a, it's a great day. I have a lot of great days. So, yeah. The need for more information technology specialists in schools is growing as more districts shift to online testing and learning. A recent survey found that 40% of districts around the country provide one laptop or tablet device per student also known as one-to-one -one computing. The biggest challenge cited by school districts was making sure they have wireless networks that can support these devices. State takeover, insolvency, school budget disaster. We've all seen startling headlines in recent years about some school districts across California. But what does it all mean? We're 41st in the nation in what we spend per kid. In California, I mean, the richest state, you know, in the richest nation on the face of the earth. And the pathetic funding that we have per pupil is something that's got to be dealt with. With more than 6 million students and 1,100 school districts, California has the largest public school system in the country. But some school districts are struggling financially. Will you see more enter into this general category of fiscal distress? Yes, you will. We've enjoyed the longest economic growth period in California since World War II. Yet hundreds of school districts are cutting their budgets. So what's the problem here? The problem here is that what we're not doing in a growing economy is investing in education. We're just not doing it. According to many in education, the problem also has to do with the state increasing the financial burden on districts at a time when many districts face declining revenue. While each district faces unique challenges, experts agree there are some common factors contributing to the budget crisis in California's schools. Factor number one, the pension system. Most teachers are in the CalSTRS system, and Jerry Brown, uh, you know, the governor at the time a few years ago, realized, you know, of course, we need to put more money into the system. So the, they raised the contribution for districts over time so that districts would have time to build that increase into their budget. 
That increase will more than double what districts are required to contribute to employee pensions, going from 8.3% of their payroll in the 2013-2014 school year to 19.1% by 2021. They want you to have the money today for the person that you hire today so that when they retire, the money will be there. In his first year in office, California Governor Gavin Newsom pledged $3 billion to help offset the large increase in pension costs school districts are having to pay. District officials say it's a step in the right direction, but it still isn't enough. Contributing factor number two, declining enrollment. About 60% of school districts in California are declining enrollment, and that's a significant issue because their revenue from the state is tied to enrollment and attendance. Many parents in financially strapped districts are moving their kids to charter or private schools, and it's happening at a rapid pace. Adding to the financial pressure is the way schools are funded, on a per-pupil, per-day basis. For each child who misses a day of school, the district receives less money, even though they're paying the same amount for the teacher and the classroom. Contributing factor number three, the increasing costs of everything. We are seeing increased costs on so many fronts. We're experiencing an increase in our pension costs. We are experiencing an increase in our health care costs. Um, we are also seeing an increase just in the cost of doing business. According to Sacramento Unified School District officials, those increases have put them $35 million in the red. Currently, Sac City Unified spends uh, 91 cents of every dollar on employee benefits and salaries, and we're trying to work with our labor partners to lower that to the state average of 86 cents per dollar, or even lower if we can. The simple solution seems to be, well, the largest chunk of the budget are teacher salaries, so let's cut teacher salaries and we'll save the money. That's not the solution, <laughs> and very rarely is. There are consequences if they don't ultimately stabilize. Michael Fine leads the organization tasked with keeping school districts out of financial trouble. It's called FICMAT, which stands for Fiscal Crisis and Management Assistance Team. They work with troubled districts to find options for recovery. Districts that still struggle after several FICMAT warnings may face what many call a state takeover. The official term, insolvency. When a school district has insufficient cash to meet payroll, and they have exhausted all of their cash borrowing options, then that's the definition of insolvency. At that point, the district is forced to ask the state for a loan. That loan triggers a transfer of governing authority. Until the fall of 2018, that authority was transferred to the state. That's why you hear it called a state takeover. In 2018, the process was changed, giving counties the authority and requiring them to appoint an outside administrator to govern the district. Generally, the superintendent is dismissed, and that uh, administrator that the county superintendent assigns then becomes the board, the superintendent, and they go to work solving the budget problems. They look at cutting all expenses that aren't mandatory. Higher class sizes, fewer resources for the students, all those kinds of things. And it then it also burdens the district with, with uh, loans that take them years to pay off. Well, state takeover be not good for our students or families, and that's why we're trying to do everything we can to avoid it. Officials familiar with the process say insolvency ends up costing school districts far more after paying back the loan and millions of dollars in interest. There's also concern that an outside administrator would be focused on the fiscal solvency of the district and not on the classroom. The main concern as a parent is for the long term, the future students coming into the Sac City Unified School District. There's been talk that if the state takes over, then we'll have a lot less money than we already do right now. And if that happens, then we're going to have to make a lot of cuts. With all the people leaving, I mean, you're just going to be left with, you know, schools that are not well taken care of. And then now you've got maybe less, you know, teachers and other cutbacks and so bigger class sizes. So, yeah, it's just going to be a horrible situation. But despite what sounds like a gloomy situation, experts in education say there are signs that the tide could be turning. They're actually optimistic. It gives me great optimism to see a governor who says in his State of the State address, the first governor in decades to actually acknowledge that we've got a problem with per pupil funding and something has to be done about it. Since 1991, we've had nine school districts and one community college district that didn't respond to the intervention. To have nine 
um, in 27, 28 years, I think is probably a pretty good record. It's actually a reflection that the system's working. I believe that we are on the verge because of all the changes we've made of doing some really exciting things in California differently than anywhere else in the country. If you'd like more information about the program, log on to our website, InsideCalEd.org. We have video from all of our shows, and you can connect with us on social media. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on Inside California Education. So it's really heavy, but um, the kids love it. Hey, guys, how y'all doing tonight? Good? You guys excited to be here? Yeah? Okay, y'all can be a little bit louder. Come on. And none of these fish are in any way going to harm any of you here as long as you don't start the fight, all right? Funding for Inside California Education is made possible by... Since 1985, the California Lottery has raised more than $34 billion in supplemental funding for California's 1,100 public school districts from kindergarten through college. That's approximately $211 for each full-time student, based on $1.7 billion contributed in fiscal year 2017-18. With caring teachers, committed administrators, and active parents, every public school student can realize their dreams. The California Lottery, imagine the possibilities. The Stewart Foundation, improving life outcomes for young people through education. Additional funding for Inside California Education is made possible by these organizations supporting public education.